So, uh, we're going to start, strangely enough, in a graveyard in Pickens County, Georgia in the 1880s. So I'm just going to tell you this little story. I'm going to read a story. Um, it was told by a guy named Henry Grady, and he was talking about a funeral in Pickens County, Georgia. He said, The grave was dug through solid marble, but the marble headstone came from Vermont. It was in a pine wilderness, but the pine coffin came from Cincinnati. An iron mountain overshadowed it, but the coffin nails and the screws and the shovel came from Pittsburgh. With hard wood and metal abounding, the corpse was hauled on a wagon from South Bend, Indiana. A hickory grove near, grew nearby, but the pick and shovel handles came from New York. The cotton shirt on the dead man came from Cincinnati, the coat and breeches from Chicago, the shoes from Boston, the folded hands were encased in white gloves from New York. That country, so rich in undeveloped resources, furnished nothing for the funeral except the corpse and the hole in the ground and probably would have imported both of those, too, if it could have. So that's a little story, um, kind of an observation by um, Henry Grady, talking about a time long ago, far away from here. But I wondered if you guys kind of could pick up what he was making fun of in that little story, or what was, he, what was his comment in that little story? Does anybody want to venture? Go ahead, Evan. Essentially, that in that area, they had everything they needed to uh, for life and then for death. But they were importing literally everything from other areas, and so they were sending their money out and getting things that they could have produced in that area back. I think you just taught the whole lesson for me. But <laughs> yes, exactly. So I want you, I want you to just kind of imagine that was in 1880 in Georgia. But let's just imagine this was in the Berkshires. And could we take the same story? and then fill in the blanks for now in the Berkshires. So the grave was dug through solid marble, but the marble headstone came from China. 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 <laughs> um, it was in a pine wilderness, but the pine coffin came from China. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> um, an iron mountain overshadowed it, but the coffin nails and the screws and the shovel came from Actually, Definitely China sense. this time. <laughs> um, I talked to a, a hardware store owner in West Stockbridge a couple of years ago. I interviewed him about his business, and he, he it's um, Baldwin's Hardware in West Stockbridge. And he grew up in this business. His father ran the business before him, and he's taken it over. And he said that when he was young and when he took over the business, all of the nails and the, you know, the normal hardware that he was buying for his store came from the USA. Maybe not from the Berkshires, but from the USA. And now it all comes from China. Um, with hardwood and metal abounding, the corpse is hauled on a wagon from, well, in this case, it might be a hearse. But where would a hearse be made nowadays? <laughs> well, we might, if we're Detroit. lucky, get it made in Detroit, right? Um, and then otherwise, maybe in Japan. I don't know. Um, a hickory grove near, grew nearby, but the pick and shovel handles came from Canada, let's say. Um, the cotton shirt on the dead man came from cotton shirts, usually. Yeah, from somewhere in the Far East. Uh, the coat and breeches came from... You, so you kind of get the picture, right? So all of these things now are definitely not made nearby. Um, and he was complaining about an economy where nothing was made in Georgia or in Pickens County, Georgia, but at least it was all made in the United States at that point. And now, if we looked at that same kind of situation, most things would not even be made in the US. So he's, now we've kind of come to a globalized economy. Um, and I'd like to do, just to kind of flesh this out and see how it works in our room right now, if everybody could look at one piece of their clothing, the tag, and write down where it was made and what it's made out of. Just whatever's easiest to find.
So are there any uh, interesting discoveries? We'll just, we're not going to go around and ask everybody what they found, but are there any interesting things you found? Dominican Republic. Well, shoe. Your shoe was made in the Dominican Republic. Okay. What else? Too much China. I'm wearing an outfit from China. <laughs> anybody else find anything? Did anybody have any clothing made in the U.S.? No. Kevin? Shirt and hat. Made in the U.S.? Yep. What are the brands? Edelson and I have no idea. <laughs> Anything else? So that's pretty much representative of, of I think, our clothing industry. Um, we have most of, this is a map of um, where H&M makes their clothes. And in China is the, I guess, where they make most of their clothes. And then also in um, Southeast Asia and some in, uh, in I guess, Eastern Europe. Um, but we have a system where most of the time uh, countries or regions are going to specialize in what they make. So they're going to make a couple of things and then export them far away across the globe. And especially now in the States, we import a lot of our goods. Um, so I wanted to ask kind of what implications that has for us. If we have a system where, uh, let's say just us as Americans, we're importing most of our goods. What does that mean? What are some of the implications? Uh, well, not only the oil that it takes to make the actual good, but also to ship it over on really large cargo ships. There's a lot of non-renewable fuel sources. So it takes a lot of uh, fossil fuels to actually get those goods to us. That's one. Evan? Loss of knowledge. If you're, not, if you're exporting all your uh, production, you're losing ability to make it. That's a really good one. So that means we don't even know how, we don't have the know-how to make things like clothing often in this country. Like nobody would know how to make a hearse in the Berkshires. Nobody would know how to make a cotton shirt in the Berkshires maybe. Are there any other implications? Fiora. Um, well, the factory workers in other countries probably aren't being paid a fair wage. So one thing is that because it's happening so far away from us, we can't really see how these things are being made. So that transparency is lost. And often, now I think a lot of clothing companies are trying to work on that. So they're trying to show you where their clothes are coming from and, and like what happens along the line. But because our, say my sweater was made in China, which I think it was. Uh, I have no idea how this was made, how this red dye affected the workers that made the sweater. Um, it's so far away that we're kind of removed from the whole process. And maybe our values aren't necessarily, they, we don't know how our values align with the way that this was made, right? Um, anything else? Any other implications? The profits from the production are so far removed from us. Like if if I was if I was milling the fabric that was making the shirt that was being sold to a Berkshire person, it would every every aspect of that profit would stay in the Berkshires, but instead it's going to Sri Lanka or China or wherever. Right. So just like Evan was saying, we're actually sending our money far away to get the goods, um, and then that money doesn't come back to us really. It goes to wherever the owner of the company is. Right. Um, and another thing, just in terms of um, clothing, is that a lot of our fabrics now are made with, with petroleum, with oil. So, um, and that's something that we don't necessarily know, because you know, it's so far away from us, so we don't know. So not only does it take fossil fuel to make them, it actually is made with oil. Um, and this is a photo from a factory collapse in Bangladesh, which is, it made the news. But you know, a lot of things don't make the news that we that are related to how our clothes get made. And this is just talking about clothes, but there's lots of other goods that come from far away. So now I just want to kind of that's like where we are right now. We're in a very globalized economy, and there's many benefits to globalization. I'm sh I know, um, you know, we can communicate with people around the world. You can keep in touch with friends around the world. There's lots of great benefits. But I want to just now kind of zoom in and imagine um, 
whether, you know, how we might organize our economy otherwise. So we'll zoom in to the Berkshires. Um, and I want to ask kind of what makes, what are some of our resources in the Berkshires that make the Berkshires uh, unique or something that we might have that could lend itself to something that we make? Natural resources that we have here? Timber. Timber. Wool from sheep. Wool from sheep. <laughs> what did the sheep eat? Hay. Hay. So we have a lot of pasture. What are some other natural resources we have? Water power. Yeah, water power. We have rivers. Beauty. Beauty. So people come here because they like how it looks, and we live here often because we like how it looks. Anything else? What about human resources? So what are some of the things that we're, you know, we might have special over other regions in terms of human resources? Well, because uh, the Berkshires are beautiful and interesting, we end up with a lot of very intelligent uh, and creative people here. So we have, we great. have access to some really fantastic minds. Yeah. We also have some great institutions, such as community colleges. We have Williams. We have um, great public schools, great private schools. So we have a lot of resources here, right? Um, so I, I think that what we're asking uh, in this class is for you guys to look at what we have and consider what we might need in the Berkshires and then kind of come up with some ideas from there. Um, and so looking at uh, an economy that way, like looking at it in a regional sense, is something that this woman, Jane Jacobs, uh, advocated for. So she wrote a book called Cities and the Wealth of Nations, um, where she really said that looking at an economy in a nation, at, at a national, national level, just didn't really make sense. Because political boundaries don't really relate to geographic boundaries, resource boundaries, uh, it doesn't always make sense to look at an economy on that scale, especially because um, when you're looking at an economy at this scale, like if we were just looking at the U.S., the things that are happening in New York are very different from the things that are happening in the Berkshires, right? So if we make economic policy based on what's happening in New York, because there's 9 million people there, and not based on what's happening in the Berkshires, because there's only 130,000 people here, um, then the Berkshires might get left behind, and it might, the economic policy might not really make sense for the Berkshires that you make for New York. So she said that you should make, you should think about economies in a regional sense. Um, and what she actually, she coined the phrase import replacement, or she started to use it a lot, um, saying that import replacement was the engine for economic development. So if you start making stuff in your region that you had been importing, then it's going to actually drive your economy and really help economic development because you're going to have new jobs, new production. You're going to, instead of sending the money far away, you're going to keep it there and make stuff and have people send you their money. So that was her, her argument for how we, should, how we should look at economic development, was that we should look for opportunities to replace imports. Um, and so we've already kind of discussed a couple of reasons why that would be good. <coughs> Um, but another person who advocated for import replacement was E.F. Schumacher, and that's, I work at the Schumacher Center, and it's named after E.F. Schumacher, because we actually have all of his books and papers in our library. Um, and so he said that production from local resources for local needs is the most rational way of economic life. So he's not just saying that it's the best way to, to create economic development. He's saying it's the most rational way. It's, it's the sanest way to organize our economy. Um, while dependence on imports from afar and the need to produce for export is highly uneconomic. So he's saying that it doesn't even make sense. And he has this great story that um, he was an economist in England, even though he was German born. And he was looking at lorries or trucks that were leaving England full of cookies, or biscuits is what they would call them, mm -hmm. and heading to Scotland to sell their cookies. And then he was looking at other lorries full of biscuits coming from Scotland to England to sell their cookies. 
And he was saying, that doesn't make any sense. Why are we shipping our cookies to them and they're shipping their cookies to us? It would make much more sense if we were making our own cookies and buying them ourselves. Um, and one example of this is an, another, he's saying that it also doesn't make sense to be reliant on other places far away because you don't have any control over those places. So um, in that case, you, something could happen far across the world. You wouldn't have any control over it and then you might be cut off from things that you need. So it would make more sense to be self-reliant and make the things you need yourself. Um, and one example of this is Cuba. Um, where for a long time they were basically focusing their economy on cr growing sugar cane, making rum, and uh, growing tobacco for cigars. And they were exporting mostly to the U.S. But once, for political reasons, they got cut off from their market in the U.S., they were kind of sunk because they only knew how to make sugar cane, rum, tobacco, and cigars. And they didn't even know how to grow their own food and feed themselves. So in that case, they were just exporting to faraway markets and not being, they weren't looking after their own region and knowing how to create uh, the things they needed themselves. So you might ask, why does this matter? Or how does this actually play out? Like if you were to um, <coughs> focus your economic development on import replacement or think build up import replacement businesses, how is that going to be good for you? How is that going to be good for a region? So this is one example of how if you have more locally owned businesses in a region, your, your local economy is actually going to be a lot wealthier. Because this is what happens when you spend your money in a chain store, a retailer, such as Target or Walmart um, or, I don't know, one, a big supermarket. And this is what happens when you spend your money with a locally owned store. So Guido's or Seeds or Tom's Toys. Um, here, this is, the, this is the amount of money that stays in your local economy. So in your own small region. 13.6%. All the rest goes somewhere else. In, if you spend with a locally owned business, this is the amount. This whole section. 48% is what stays in your local community, and this is what goes out. So how does it stay in your local community? Well, because it's locally owned, the, any profits from the business stay in your community. Because it's locally owned, you're going to be hiring local people to do a lot of the work, so that stays in the local community. Because it's locally owned, the business is much more likely to buy from other locally owned businesses, so they're going to procure the goods that they need from other locally owned businesses. They're also, so that's kind of this whole section. And then, because they're locally owned and the owner actually lives in the community, they're much more likely to give to local charities. So they would be giving to the United Way or to the Brownie Troop, or they might be giving gift certificates to the local chorus, or they might be advertising in the Playbill. All of those things add up and make it so 48% of your money actually stays in the local community if you spend your money with locally owned businesses. So that means you're actually retaining that money in your, in your community rather than sending it far away. Um, because when you, send, when you spend it with a chain retailer, where does the CEO live? I don't know. Probably if it's Walmart, they live in Arkansas? I don't know. Um, if, you know if you're spending it at a chain retailer, they're going to have a whole integrated su supply chain. So they're going to have their suppliers already. Most of them are not going to be local because they have stores all around the country, right? So all that money disappears and goes somewhere else. Um, another reason that an import replacement business is going to be more helpful to your local economy and your local community is because you're going to be creating jobs in locally owned businesses. And jobs in locally owned businesses are much more likely to stick around in your community. If you have a uh, Walmart, then they might have, and I'm picking on Walmart a lot, but there's lots of businesses that are not locally owned, um, then they're going to be, if they have one down year, say they're in Pittsfield, and one year, you know, they don't have very good sales. So they can just say, oh, we're out of here. We don't, it's not worth it to us to be in Pittsfield anymore. We're just going to jump ship and leave behind all those people who were working for us. So, but if you have a job at a locally owned business, the owner lives there, and they're not going to just move away. 
They're not going to say, oh, I'm closing and I'm going to move away because I'm not doing so well. They're much more likely to stay in that place and keep employing people. Um, another reason for having a locally owned business is much uh, better for your local community um, is that it actually forces you to produce on a, on a different scale from most uh, big huge factories or big huge businesses and so you have to figure things out you have to come up with new processes new ways to make things um, and you might have to use your innovation and uh, one example is the ukulele shop in Sheffield and has anybody been there and we're, Phyllis Webb who's the owner is going to come in and talk to us later in the class um, but her husband invented a whole new way to make a ukulele because he wanted to make ukuleles in the United States. Um, and so they're employing nine people in the Berkshires instead of shipping their, their, their uh, production over to China where most ukuleles are made. So they're employing local people, they live here, they give back to the community, um, and they coach the robotics team. So they help new innovation and new expertise grow in our, in our own community. Um, so adding all that up makes a much more diverse and nice place to live, I, I would argue. Um, would you, do you guys have examples of how, how that kind of plays out? If you have local ownership, can you have, do you have any ideas of what it looks like? I would say that living in the Berkshires is a pretty great example of where we have a lot of local ownership and innovative businesses. Does anybody have like a story or example of how that makes a healthier community? Not just a healthier economy, but a healthier community? As a, like imagine we had Target, Walmart, Target, Walmart down the street instead of Tom's Toys, Matrushka, um, Seeds, and uh, Fuel. How does that play out? I mean, what is it like to live here? Well, the area is much more ugly. You're less likely to spend time in these establishments. It's not going to be as pleasant. So that with all local businesses? No, I'm talking about like these. Uh, with a big, with a big, box big business. No, I like fuel. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you have a less beautiful town. You see less fewer people. And in general, you don't uh, get the same enjoyment out of your area. So it has a. It actually has a. a kind of an effect on your well-being like you don't you know you might hang out at fuel and meet a lot of people and see people that you know and have more interactions rather than if it was just a Starbucks I don't know but does it are there any other examples I think that's good um, so there are I don't think we need to go through these because we've gone through a lot of examples but I was going to point out a couple of examples of import replacement opportunities or businesses that we already have. So one is in the timber industry, which Elizabeth mentioned. Um, right now, our economy looks like this. We cut down trees, we send them to Canada, often they go to China, um, or sometimes they get processed in Canada and come back to us. Uh, we don't have much processing right here in the Berkshires for our timber, um, except for this, which is Elizabeth's brother's <laughs> sawmill. Um, so this is a small scale sawmill where Will Conklin actually processes the, the wood that he cuts down. Then he, turn, he turns it into different things or he sells it to people. These are the tables that he made for his wedding. So instead of actually renting plastic tables from a rental company, he made tables for his own wedding. And then he rented them or let other friends borrow them for their wedding so they got used over and over again. Um, but we could also be using that timber to make furniture. This is Peter Marquette's furniture. Um, and he makes this in Southfield. Um, another example is uh, beer. So this is what a lot of our beer industry looks like with huge, you know, huge scale production. And this is what local beer making looks like, like down in Sheffield, Big Elm. Um, and these are, lot, we have lots of local breweries uh, that are doing really well. This is another example of a uh, brewery in Framingham, Mass, and I wanted to pick out this one because they started up their brewery seeing a need for a local beer. Um, they were very successful with their product, and they actually moved into this building, which is an old mill that was not in use. It was a paper mill 
that had employed lots of people. Um, it was kind of in the center of Framingham. But for a long time, it's been out of use. So it was empty. And they had this great successful product. They were expanding, and they moved into this building. So they were, they're reusing a building that had been just abandoned, um, which is a great example of why you'd want more local production in our towns. We have a lot of mills around here in the Berkshires um, that are not used right now. So here's an example you probably all recognize of Monterey Chev. So this is Susan Salou's business where she started making Monterey Chev in uh, 19, well she probably made it, started making it a lot before that, but her business started up in 1983 with a small scale loan from a bunch of local community people. Um, and now this product is something that you find in all the local stores, and I hope you've all tasted it. Um, and it's kind of like an iconic uh, product of the Berkshires. <coughs> and when she started, nobody knew what Chev was. And the bankers wouldn't give her a loan because none of the bankers knew what Chev was. So that's an example of a, something that was missing from our community, and now she's created it, and it's become a successful business. Cleaning products are another example, and then like what Howard was talking about. Um, wool products. Um, so those are just some, some ideas. And we're going to go uh, at the end. I think in the, the last page of your packet is an import replacement worksheet. So that's actually your homework is to just fill that up as much as possible with different ideas. They can be crazy off the wall ideas. They can be really practical ideas. I just want you to fill it up um, and talk to your friends, talk to your family, ask people what they think and come back with that that worksheet completely full next week um, and from that I, that worksheet I'd like you to pick a couple that really interest you that you think would be good ideas fun to write about fun to research fun to learn more about but I want you to start by just filling that sheet up a